Happy Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. Yes. Amen. Well, it's good to see everybody. It's good to see uh, we have some new folks. Welcome. And of course, we have come here this morning to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ from the dead. You know, one of the greatest texts on the subject of resurrection is found in John chapter 11. If you would turn there, John chapter 11, primarily I'm looking at verses 25 and 6, which by the time we're done today, we will have quoted to you about 80 times, and you will remember them, believe me. But let's read it the first time. John 11, verses 25 to 27, uh, 25 to 26, I should say. Where Jesus said to her, now, he's talking to Martha. And the whole context is that there was a family that Jesus was very close to who lived um, in Bethany, which was on the other side of the Mount of Olives, uh, close to Jerusalem. So when he would spend the day in Jerusalem ministering, he would go to their house often where he would spend the night. And it was a family of uh, three uh, siblings, Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. Well, Lazarus had died. And so Jesus finally comes, and um, Martha's upset with him that he didn't get there sooner. And uh, he said to her in verse 25, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Guys, this chapter brings us face to face with the inevitable consequence of life, which is death. On the one hand, death is a reality that each one of us must face at some point in the future. But also, as, as people have said, death is the grim reaper that has touched every one of our lives already by taking from us people that we love and in its wake has left behind pain, grief, and loneliness, which reminds us of our own um, mortality and the tenuousness of life. The Bible says um, life is here today. It could be gone tomorrow. Make sure you're right with God. Make sure you keep your accounts taken care of, accounts with your loved ones, that you're not taken from this earth before you say all that you want to say to people. As someone has said, death is a specter that haunts the end of the corridor of every person's life. And we all know that death is no respecter of persons. It's completely non-discriminating in who it claims. It doesn't care. Death doesn't care if a person is small or great, rich or poor, young or old, male or female. No one escapes its grasp. From the very beginning, death has both, both mystified and terrified mankind. The Bible tells us that the human race has been taken captive by death, which has forced people to live all their lives in bondage to the fear of death. And yet, if death has any benefit here on earth, it forces us to grapple with the most important questions about life. Questions like, why am I here? What is life really all about? And when I die, what happens then? Is that it? Or is death merely a doorway into another life, into another existence? Now, these questions burn deep in the heart of every person. Questions that most people don't wrestle with every day, that's for sure. And yet they're never far from our consciousness. And from time to time they'll surface and force people to wrestle with them. Maybe, you know, I'm talking about unbelievers now, primarily. Not Christians, although we were there at one time. We don't wrestle with these questions all the time, but they do surface once in a while. Maybe when the party is over, and all the guests have gone home, and you're laying in your bed, and the drugs or the alcohol are beginning to wear out, to wear off, I should say. And you're just laying there in the darkness, staring at the ceiling. And you're asking yourself, is this all there is to life? I mean, 
is this what life is really all about, to work all week, make money, so that on the weekends I can party and take drugs and get blasted and hook up, only to start the whole thing over again on Monday? Is that really what it's all about? Is that old axiom really true? Life is about eat, drink, be merry, because tomorrow you die, that's it? Or is that it? When I die, what happens then? Is it the end? Or, again, is it the beginning of something new? But then, you know, before long, they drift off to sleep. And in the morning, those questions are gone because now they have important things on their minds. Like that big meeting at work that day. Or to remember they have to pick up their clothes from the cleaners after work. Or take the car in for service. You know, stuff that really matters. But guys, listen, it's life that often keeps us from thinking about death. But it's death that often forces us to wrestle with the really important issues of life. Every funeral I ever do, I always quote from Ecclesiastes 7.2. Let me read it to you. Here's what Solomon said. I'll read it to you out of the NLT. Better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies. So the living should take this to heart. Right? I mean, if you spend all your time at parties, you're living in the moment. You're not thinking of the future. You're not wrestling with those really important issues of life. But at a funeral, you're brought face to face with your own mortality. We're all going to die. And maybe it was somebody that you knew very well, somebody that was way too young to have died. Somebody your age, and now you're thinking, that could be me. And that happens all the time. If you let it, if you let death stop you long enough from your busyness to ask yourselves those really important questions... Like, why am I here and what happens to me after I die? Then it's not a wasted experience. Hopefully you will allow death to force you to look honestly uh, at the meaning of life. And ultimately to ask yourself or people in general, hopefully that death will force them to ask the question that Job asked in the oldest book in the Bible. If a man dies, will he live again? You realize Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It's not the first in the cover, but it goes back about 2,500 years before Christ. Genesis was written by Moses, the first five books, around 1500 B.C. So Job is the oldest book in the Bible. And way back there, Job asked the question that was burning in the hearts of a lot of people. If a man dies, will he live again? Well, Job asked the question. Here in John 11, Jesus answered it. Again, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And then because talk is cheap, he went on to prove that he was, and still is, of course, but that he was the resurrection and the life by raising Lazarus from the dead. The whole chapter is built around the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead to teach us that death is not final. And by the way, life is not meaningless. Depends how you live it, how you approach it, and who you know, which is Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus is the author. And the giver of life, the Bible tells us, who came, to, who came to the earth to rob death of its sting and the grave of its victory by dying in the cross and rising from the dead on the third day. Listen, not only to give us eternal life in heaven someday, but real purpose and meaning to our lives here on earth right now. And yet there are many skeptics, apolog uh, agnostics I should say, and atheists. And their number is growing. We are living in a post-Christian era in our country. I pray God brings an incredible revival and we are catapulted back into a Christian nation. But Jesus says something that's always haunted me. He said, when the Son of Man returns, will he really find faith on the earth? 
We see skeptics, agnostics, unbelievers, atheists. Their numbers are growing. And they would look at uh, these verses and they would say something to the effect, hey, wait a minute. That's a pretty radical thing to say. Who does this guy think he is? I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, he will live again. He who lives and believes in me will never die. Well, I agree. I agree. Anyone who would dare make a statement like that would have to be a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. And you've got to come to terms in your own heart which of those applies to Jesus. But then Jesus pressed it, didn't he? He makes these radical statements, and then he just doesn't leave them hanging in the air. He presses it home, which he did right here by saying, do you believe this? Do you believe this, Martha? But of course, by extension, he was asking all of us as we read his words, do you believe this? You see, that automatically divides people into two groups. Those who believe and those who do not believe. Jesus was a radical. And you can't be neutral when it comes to a radical. Do you believe this? It's either yes, I do believe, or no, I don't believe. But either way, Jesus demands that you take a stance as to who he is. Turn to Matthew 16. Uh, it was getting a little hot in Jerusalem. I don't mean by w the weather. So he decides to take his guys up north for a little break from the political climate in Jerusalem. So they're way up north now, near Lebanon. And Matthew 16, verse 13, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, we would probably phrase it this way. Hey, guys, what's the word on the street? What are people saying about me? Kind of a thing. So they said, well, some believe you're John the Baptist. Come back from the dead. Same with others who believe you're Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. That's great. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? You know, it really doesn't matter what I think about Jesus Christ when it comes to your life. It really doesn't matter what your parents think about Jesus Christ or your husband or your wife or a good friend. It only matters what you think about Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't leave it in general terms. Well, who do people say that I am? Oh, they got all kinds of concepts. Okay, but who do you say that I am? You see, salvation is a very personal thing, isn't it? It's not something you can inherit from your parents because they're Christians. Although I think some people think that's how it works. You know? They were raised in a Christian home, so they automatically think that their parents' faith is passed on to them. That they're automatically a Christian and saved. It has been truly said that God has many children, but no grandchildren. Because every person has to be born of the Spirit of God personally. You're not going to get born again from my faith. You might listen to me, take it to heart, and pray to Jesus to be saved, and you'll be born of the Spirit too. But God has no grandkids. You have to, each one of you, has to come to terms for yourself as to who Jesus is. And then what you're going to do about that information once you arrive at that conclusion. You could turn to Matthew 22 quickly. I'm just giving you a little flavor of what we're talking about. Now in Matthew 22, verse 42, Jesus asked the Pharisees a similar question. Now these were religious leaders in Israel. And he said to them, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? In other words, Jesus is asking these religious leaders, what do each of you believe about me? 
Am I just the son of a man, or in other words, an ordinary human being? Or do you believe that I am the son of God and divine? Guys, this is the most important question you will ever have to grapple with. Because this question carries with it eternal consequences. There's a lot of things you can get wrong about Jesus and still go to heaven. What do I mean? Well, you can think he was four foot two. <laughs> or six five. Some people think he must have glowed in the dark because he was really that holy. Fine, whatever. That's not important information. Not believing he's the son of God, that'll keep you out of heaven. How do I know? Because Jesus, Jesus said it in John 8, 24. Unless you believe that I am Jehovah God, God Almighty, in human form, you're going to die in your sins and spend eternity apart from me in hell. So there are essential doctrines, right? Things you can't get wrong. This is one of them. Now, if you believe that Jesus was just an ordinary human being, you know, the son of a man, a good man, a moral man, great religious leader possibly in your mind, a leader and teacher sent here by God to teach us spiritual truth, but not the son of God. He's a good teacher, very moral man, um, but just a man. He wasn't the son of God. In other words, God in human form. you got a problem, in my mind at least. I mean, how do you deal with Jesus' statement here in John 11? Let me read it again. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Um, and then he drives it home by making it personal when he said, Do you believe this? You see, that statement is so radical, it immediately separates Jesus from every other religious teacher that has ever come down the pike of history. He never allowed himself to be grouped together with all these other religious people. He did that purposely because they were men, he is God. They had a way, wasn't going to get to heaven or lead to heaven. He had the way, he was the way, the only way to the Father. And that's what he said in John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to heaven. Nobody gets to the Father except through me. This really drives people up a wall who are very into the tolerant, you know, Broadway kind of concept. You know, Jesus talked about the Broadway and the narrow way, right? People like that Broadway idea because it's tolerant, it's accepting. It's easy. It's anyone can enter. That's true. Problem is they're not going to heaven down that way. He says it's the way that leads to destruction. Only the narrow way leads to eternal life. Who is the narrow way? Jesus. And the cross. But he didn't say I'm one of many ways. You know, there's other people that have led spiritual movements just be sincere. It really doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you're sincere. A lot of folks believe that. But the Bible says that God does not count sincerity for righteousness. He counts faith in the truth for righteousness. So Jesus said, look, I'm not one of many ways. I am the only way. Well, I don't like that, Lord. Well, that's the way it is. Why can't there be Ten ways. Look, if Jesus said there was a hundred ways, somebody would have said, why isn't there a hundred and one ways? Man's never satisfied. I'm just glad there's a way. But Jesus constantly made claims about himself that were fundamentally intolerant and exclusionary. He never allowed himself to be grouped together with other religious teachers and leaders in history. I mean, look, how, how anybody can say that Jesus was a great religious teacher and yet essentially reject everything he taught about himself and salvation to me is absurd. Look, if you were to go out today, say you went to Chicago and you started interviewing people on the streets. Who do men say that I am? All right, we'll go out and we'll, we'll get a word, the word on the street. All right? 
Say you did that. I'm convinced as I give you this hypothetical exchange, this would be more common than you would realize because this is where people are coming from today. But just imagine, you went out and you found somebody walking down the street and you said, look, can I ask you a few questions? I'm doing a kind of a survey. Oh, okay. Who is Jesus Christ? Well, I believe he was a great religious teacher sent here by God to teach us truth. Oh, all right. Well, um, Jesus said that he was the only true God in human form. Do you believe that? Uh, no, not really. I believe we're all gods on our way to consciousness and, and God consciousness and enlightenment, right? That's a big one today. We're all part of the God consciousness. You just forgot you're a God. That's why you're going to be enlightened. How could a God forget he's a God? It doesn't tell him much of a God in my mind. But there's a lot of people that believe that out there. No, we're all, we're all gods on our way to enlightenment and God consciousness. Um, well, Jesus also said that he was the Savior of the world. Um, oh, excuse me, that he was the Savior who came into the world to save mankind from, uh, from sin and hell. Do you believe that? Well, first of all, I don't believe there's a hell. I believe right here in the earth, this is hell. There's no place called hell. This is hell. But when it comes to sin, no, I don't believe that Jesus forgives us for our sins because I don't believe we're sinners. I don't believe in absolute right and wrong. Hey, whatever's right for you is right for you. Whatever right is right for me is right for me. We're all taking, you know, we, we, we're, none of us are wrong, really. It's all what we believe in our hearts is right to do. And then finally, if you're not sick by this time, you say, well, you know, Jesus said he was the only way to heaven. Do you believe that? Oh, no, I believe there's many roads that lead to heaven. Now, look, if I had a conversation with somebody on the street that went this way, and it started by asking, who is Jesus? Oh, he's a great religious teacher sent by God to teach a spiritual truth. And, and, and you answer, this person answered this way, I would say, look, what makes him such a great religious teacher? You've pretty much rejected everything he said or taught about himself and salvation. People today have not really thought through what they believe. And as such, their belief systems are horribly convoluted, um, contradictory, you know. And that's why if you gently and lovingly just point out some things, you may get them to realize, you know what? I never thought of it that way. If I could get to heaven by being good, well, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? That's a big one, you know? A lot of people haven't thought it through. But this idea of Jesus being a great moral leader and teacher, and, but not God, is, is the height of folly. I mean, you all remember the famous quote from C.S. Lewis in his a book, Mere Christianity. He said, and I'm quoting him, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a, who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says that he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil, the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else he was a madman or something worse. Look, you can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord, uh, call him Lord and God. But let's, uh, let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to, end quote. I mean, not only did Jesus make these outrageous statements, outrageous if he wasn't who he claimed to be, by the way, not outrageous if he was, in fact, who he claimed to be, but a lot of folks don't really know what they think about Jesus. So Jesus made these outrageous statements about himself, and then he backed them up with miracles, didn't he? 
which separated him from every other religious teacher or leader that has ever lived. I mean, look, what other religious leader in history ever did the things that Jesus did? Did Buddha ever feed thousands of people with a cup, five small, actually, there weren't five loaves. That's a misconception. There were barley crackers. Think of a Ritz cracker. Um, that was the lunch. The two pickled fish, like a couple of sardines, that was to add a little moisture. Yeah, I, re I see these biblical movies. And, you know, that's why I don't often watch biblical movies. You know, when Jesus is multiplying the fish and they're dumping baskets out with two to three, four pound bass coming out, uh, big loaves of bread. No, this was a kid's sack lunch. He grabbed a few barley crackers and a couple of small pickled fish. That's what Jesus multiplied. That's a different message. But <laughs> did Buddha ever feed thousands with, you know, a couple of pickled fish and some barley crackers? Did Confucius ever calm the wind and the sea with just a word? Did Muhammad ever raise anyone from the dead? And by the way, what person in history, whether they were religious or secular, ever said that I'm going to die on the cross, but the third day I'm going to take my life up again. I'm going to be resurrected. And then did it. Anybody can make goofy claims. No, that wasn't a goofy claim. I'm sorry. If you're an unbeliever, it would be a goofy claim. It wasn't a goofy claim for Jesus, of course. You know, this is something that we have to understand. Um, Jesus' whole ministry, by the way, was writing on that one, that one prophecy. If he didn't, he said, well, look, I'm the son of God. I have the power to lay my life down. I have the power to take it up again, John 10. And I'm going to Jerusalem. And there I'm going to be handed over to wicked men. They're going to crucify me. On the third day, I'm going to rise again. His whole ministry was now writing on that one prediction. If he didn't come back from the dead, we would have written his entire life and ministry off. But of course he did come back from the dead, as he promised. I mean, if any other person in history would have made the statements that Jesus made, you would have no problem immediately writing it off as the ravings of a madman. Can you imagine, can you imagine if Napoleon ever said, I'm the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, though you die, you're going to live again. If you live and believe in me, you'll never die. Okay, let's get rid of this guy. He's, he's whacked out, right? How about Einstein, brilliant man? What if Einstein would have said those words? As brilliant as he was, people would have written him off as a kook, a weirdo, a fraud. How about George Washington? I think most every American reveres, respects George Washington. Godly man. Father of our nation in many ways? What if George Washington would have said, I'm the resurrection and the life, and so on and so forth? I mean, people would have immediately written him off as, if not a liar, a lunatic. He needed help. Look, there's only one person in history who could have made a statement like that and been taken seriously, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. As Jesus said it. It, it just rolls off his tongue, and we're like, oh, yeah, of course. We don't doubt it. We embrace it. We know that he is the Son of God. And when he made a statement like that, absolutely, absolutely it's true. Now, look, if you're a skeptic here this morning or an agnostic, you might be thinking, look, the words of Christ are ridiculous. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall never die. All of Jesus' disciples died. Christians die all the time. This is ridiculous. How could you Christians believe this stuff? Well, obviously, Jesus had a different perspective of death than most people. For example, he said to his disciples, we need to go to Bethany because Lazarus is sleeping. And his disciples said, well, that's good. If he's sleeping, he's going to get better. He's sick, right? And Jesus said, no, he's dead. If you want, I'll use your turn. 
but he was trying to use another term to show them that what we call death, at least for the Christian, isn't death at all. I mean, technically, a person is considered dead physically when all brain activity stops. At that point, their consciousness or their soul has departed from their body, and therefore, from a physical, clinical standpoint, that person is dead. Now, that's physical death. Spiritual death is, death is different. The Bible talks about both. When we talk about spiritual death, what the Bible means is that a person uh, is dead, but that, that, not that their consciousness is separated from their body. A person is spiritually dead when their consciousness is separated from God when their consciousness or their soul is separated from God. In this condition, even though they are alive physically, as God sees them, they are dead spiritually. Dead to his voice, dead to his touch, dead to his leading, and so on. This is a description of the natural man or the unbeliever. They have been born into this world consciously separated from God. Now, that doesn't mean they never think about God. doesn't mean they don't go to church. Some of them light candles in church every day. It doesn't mean that they don't serve God necessarily. You'd be shocked to know how many churches are pastored by unbelievers. Shepherds that are not shepherds are wolves in sheep's clothing. But you got deacons, Sunday school teachers. You've got professors at so-called Christian universities, many of whom don't even know Jesus. You'd be shocked. But typically when a person really doesn't have a desire to live for God, not just go to church once in a while, but they really don't have a desire to live for God, uh, for him to actively and consistently control their life, but instead their whole life is wrapped up in the pursuit of pleasure, doing their own thing, just living for themselves. The Bible says that that's the kind of person you are. As God has said very specifically, that person is dead while they are still living. A person can be alive physically and be dead spiritually. How do I know that? Because I was one of them. And everybody in this room who has accepted Christ, you were too. Paul said it in Ephesians 2, verse 1, talking to the Ephesian Christians. He said, at one point, I'm going to paraphrase, you all know you were dead in trespasses and sins, but then you received Christ and God resurrected you. He made you alive spiritually. Look, and we talked about this Friday night, so I'm not going to belabor it. But spiritual death, the spiritual death of the human race happened through the sin of Adam. In Adam all what? Die. In Adam all die. See, God said to Adam, and of course Eve was there too, and you know. But God said to Adam that, look, there are probably th thousands of fruit-bearing trees in the Garden of Eden. And you and Eve can eat of any of the trees you want except for one. You can't eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is in the midst of the garden, because in the day that you eat the fruit of that tree, you will surely die. Well, of course, they ate that forbidden fruit, and they did die. But not physically, at least not right away. They did die. Sin did set in motion aging and death, physically speaking. But God said, in the day you eat of that forbidden fruit, you're going to die. Well, what happened immediately? What death did they experience? They experienced spiritual death. As we said Friday, God is a triune being. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And God made us originally as a triune being of, of spirit, soul, consciousness, and body. And as we said, man connected with God, spirit to spirit, for fellowship, communion, and so on. But when Adam ate that forbidden fruit, his spirit died. We are all the descendants of Adam. So every person born into this world has been born a descendant of Adam and have been born with a dead spirit. 
a spirit that is dead, and therefore we have been separated from God. You can read Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. The sin of Adam separated the human race from God and turned us into two-dimensional creatures, just like animals. Not that every human being is as bad as the, the next, but we are fallen humanity is people that are two-dimensional creatures. Spirit is dead. Body has been flipped up to the uppermost position. And now the soul or the consciousness only lives to satisfy the body's appetites, like the animal kingdom. Food, water, sex. That's where a lot of folks live. Now, we didn't realize it when we were born into this world and began to grow up and we end up party and, and indulge our flesh in anything it wanted. But you can only party so much. You can only take so many drugs. You can only drink so much alcohol. You can only buy so many things. And eventually the gnawing emptiness inside of your heart, which God created you with. The Bible says he created every human being with a God-shaped void. A void that can only be filled with Jesus. We try to stuff everything else into it, don't we? But that void can only be filled with Jesus Christ. And so eventually people began to get depressed. That's a good thing. God's working. He's convicting. He's chasing them. Because he wants to tackle them, open their eyes to the emptiness of their life, so they come to Jesus for salvation. So every person after Adam has been born spiritually dead with a soul that's been separated from God. When Jesus said in John eleven twenty five, he said to, Mary, uh, to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he, she, may die. What does that mean? Everybody's going to die. What do you mean? Um, he who believes in me, though he may die, shall live again. I don't get that. Well, there is a generation that's not going to see death. There is a generation that's not going to die. What do you mean? If you're a Christian here this morning, when Jesus comes for his church at the rapture, as we said a moment ago, when the, uh, the, the trumpet sounds, the angel shouts, and the Lord says, come up here. We will go instantly from our fallen bodies and be given glorified bodies. We won't taste death. I'm, that's getting my vote. I, that's, that, that's, I take that one, Lord. But you know. But what Jesus is saying here is that is as a Christian, you might die physically, again, unless you're raptured. So even though your consciousness or your soul might someday be separated from your body, that doesn't mean you, the real you, is dead. Hear me out. I mean, the body might be dead, but the body isn't the real you anyways, as we so often make the mistake of thinking. The real me is my soul. My consciousness. I live in this body, which God has given to me so that I can express myself on the earth in this dimension. But this body was never made for heaven. It was made from the dust of the earth, for the earth, will someday return back to the dust of the earth, right? I need a new model if I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. This body works here, but it's, you know... This, this, this is not going to work in heaven any more than if God says uh, the ocean is heaven. Jump in. Well, wait a minute, Lord. I, I can't live in the ocean with this body. I'm not, this body is not, um, has not been made for that environment. Same is true with heaven. It's a whole new spiritual dimension. We need a new body. So the real me is, is soul, it's consciousness. I live in this body. God has given me this body so I can express myself uh, on the earth in this physical dimension. 
It's not going to last forever. Again, though, this physical body is not the real me. The soul is the real me. The body is only a vehicle. Think of a car. Think of a car, which takes you from point A to point B. The car is not the real you. It's only a vehicle that you use to get from place to place. The same is true with our physical bodies. But someday, as a Christian, this body is going to wear out. And when that happens, my soul is going to move out. I'm going to move out of this old worn out tent, as the Bible calls the physical body. And it's getting worn out more and more every day. Um, but the Bible likens the physical body to a tent. A tent is not permanent. A tent is temporary. Just like this physical body is temporary. But the good news is, is when I move out of this old worn out tent, I'm going to move into a beautiful new mansion <laughs> Uh, of God, a glorified body, which the Bible says has not been made with hands and is eternal in the heavens. And guys, this is what Jesus meant in verse 25 when he said, He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. He was talking about physical bodily resurrection, which for the Christian happens at the rapture. You can read 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, classic passages on the rapture. But then he had something in verse 26, as we kind of wind this down. He says in verse 26, And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Now, now he's talking spiritually and not physically. Verse 25, he was talking about physical death and the fact that if you're a Christian, you're going to be resurrected at the time of the rapture, your body. But then he says, And whoever lives and believes in me is never going to die. Well, he's talking spiritually now. This is the hope of every child of God because I live and believe in Jesus. I'm never going to die. Now, look, that doesn't mean uh, that won't necessarily, you know, that doesn't mean there won't necessarily be a funeral service someday for this old body. I just mean that the real me won't die because Jesus has given me eternal life, and eternal life cannot die. By his very definition, it's life for eternity. So instead of a funeral service, maybe we just should have a moving party. <laughs> My pastor used to say this all the time. Then I realized he got it from D.L. Moody. And D.L. Moody said at one point, look, if you read in the paper one day that D.L. Moody has died, don't you believe it? At that moment, I will be more alive than I ever have been on this earth. So true, right? Because the body may wear out and die, but the spirit, the, I mean, the soul goes to be with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. Why do I know that? Why do I know that if this old tent wears out, my soul is going to be, it's going to move into a glorious new mansion, um, a glorified body. How do I know that? Because Jesus told me. And by the way, not just the good man Jesus or the wonderful religious teacher Jesus. Yeah, those things, but the Jesus who is the Son of God, who died in Calvary's cross to pay for my sins, who came back to life three days later, the one who called himself the resurrection and the life. The only question that needs to be answered now is, do you believe this? Do you believe this? And, and, and there's always somebody that would just jump right in and say, oh, yes, certainly I believe that. I, I do believe that. I've always believed in Jesus. That's great. That's great. But what exactly do you believe about Jesus? So, you know, one of the problems that people have when it comes to salvation is an incomplete understanding of what it means to truly believe in Jesus. Look, James tells us that the demons all believe in Jesus. The Bible says that Satan believes in Jesus. In fact, you realize, of course, that Satan believes Jesus is the Son of God. He knew him in heaven before he ever became incarnated on the earth. Jesus Christ is the Son of God from all eternity. 
Satan knows that. Satan knows that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He saw Gabriel deliver the message to Mary, uh, a, a virgin teenager. Was it Luke 1? Where the angel Gabriel was dispatched to Mary and said to her that she had been chosen by God to be the mother of Messiah. And she said, how can that be? I'm a virgin. I've never known a man like that. Well, the power of the, of the highest will overshadow you, the Holy Spirit will impregnate your womb with the seed of God without physical contact. And, the, and that Holy One that is to be born will be called the Son of God. Satan was there. He knew that. Satan believed Jesus died on the cross. Who do you think put him there? Satan knows that he rose from the dead three days later. Satan was standing there when the angel came and picked up that 4,000-pound round stone and moved it out of the way. He said, what do you mean? The tomb had a channel on the ground that a slight incline. And after they put Jesus' body in the tomb, several guys rolled that stone over their mouth. And they sealed it. We read, I think it's John's Gospel that tells us most clearly that at one point, an angel came and moved the stone. But when John comes across the scene, when he finally, him and Peter finally get there, the Greek is, he's perplexed. Why? Because the stone isn't just rolled up the channel back to its starting point. He said it's been moved, and the Greek word is iro. It means to pick up and carry a very large angel, and I think they're all probably pretty large, picked up that stone and moved it and tossed it off to the side. First of all, he did that not to let Jesus out. He did that to let the disciples in. But God wanted this scene to be unusual. God wanted this scene to communicate something supernatural has taken place. Look, Satan believes everything we believe about Jesus Christ. You realize that? Every Christian in this room, everything you believe about Jesus, Satan believes. He was there to see it happen. All of it. So why isn't he going to heaven? He believes everything we believe. Because the Bible says to get to heaven, yes, you must believe in the facts about Jesus. But you must believe to the point of commitment. Satan has never committed his life to, to Jesus Christ. He may have the facts up here, but he's never made a commitment in his heart to Jesus. That's the difference. Let's finish again. Verses 25 and 6. Jesus said to her, to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Well, in verse 27, Martha gives the correct answer. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world, or who has come into the world. Mary, Martha got it right. Martha's in heaven right now with the Lord. But what about you guys in this room or watching online? Oh, I believe it. I've always believed in Jesus. Great. Have you made a commitment to him? A commitment that says, Lord, I want you to come into my heart. I want you to be my king, my savior. I, I don't want to live for myself anymore. I want to live the rest of my life on this planet for your glory. Have you done that? If you haven't, you've got head knowledge, and that's great. That's a starting point, but you don't have a heart commitment, and that's how you get saved. That's what saving faith is all about. If you'd like to do that, if you'd like to 
receive Jesus into your heart by making a commitment to him, you already believe what you should believe. If you like to make that commitment to him, whether you're watching online or are in this room, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and I'm going to just say a simple prayer. Repeat after me. It's not a magic prayer. You got to mean it from your heart. God knows the heart. If you want to receive Jesus right now as your Savior and your King, pray this prayer with me. Just silently in your heart as I pray it. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God who came down to die on the cross to pay for my sins. I believe that three days later you rose from the dead bodily, that you eventually ascended back to the Father, and that you are coming again to establish your kingdom on the earth. I want to be a part of that kingdom. And so, Lord, I invite you to come into my heart right now. I'm asking you to be my Savior. Give me grace to turn my life fully over to you. Fill me with your Spirit. Give me the power to live for you every day. That I might be a light in this darkness and someone who brings honor and glory to your name through my life. I ask all of this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. If you pray that prayer, you are now a child of God. You have stepped from darkness into light, and you have a place reserved for you in heaven that the Bible teaches clearly will never fade away, will never be taken from you. May God give us all grace from this moment on, whether you're a Christian 10 years or 10 seconds or whatever, to live for the Lord from this day forward. I will tell you this. You might have come here this morning celebrating one day on a calendar, calling it Easter Sunday. That's all changed now. You've entered into a new life, the resurrection life. For you now, every day is Resurrection Sunday. Every day is new life. The old life is buried. Now, you are to live a new life for Jesus' glory. Amen? Amen. Draw close to him. He'll give you the strength to do it. And may God give us all grace to live for our Savior in these last days. And so, Father, we thank you for your great love wherewith you loved us, for sending Jesus to die for us. We thank you, Jesus, that you were a willing sacrifice. You said, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down freely for the sheep. We thank you, Lord. Give us grace to live for you like never before from this day forward. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Just a little preview of heaven. That's what that is. Um, if you have received Christ uh, this morning, you don't have a Bible, come up here. We, we have some Bibles in the back room there. Happy to give you one. rest of you guys, may God give you an awesome day, week, into the future. Every day is Resurrection Sunday. God bless you. Take care.